This 911 Strong podcast is brought to you by our partners at the Police Credit Union of California. As a financial institution founded by law enforcement for law enforcement and their families over 65 years ago, they have the experience and understanding to help you with all your financial needs, including exclusive products designed specifically for law enforcement professionals. To become a member today, visit the policecu.org. That's the police, the letter C, and the letter u.org. Or call 800-222-1391 and tell them you heard about them from the 911 Strong Podcast. Hello, friends, and welcome to the 911 Strong Podcast. With me, as always, is my friend, Kristen. Hey, guys. Hey, on this episode, we're going to talk about what's going on in the Ukraine. I know you are probably like me and probably haven't paid a lot of attention to the Ukraine up until recently. So we're going to dive into some facts, some stories, and um, just be candid about what's going on in the Ukraine. And we'll do all this and more on the next episode of the 911 Strong Podcast. It starts right now. Station to all units. Prepare to copy. You're listening to the 911 Strong Podcast. Don't act like I never told you. With Aram and Kristen, bringing you stimulating discussion. No, I like the sound of that. An entertaining conversation. And now, here's Kristen and Aram. Russian forces have grown increasingly frustrated by the Ukrainian resistance, particularly near the capital of Kiev, and the Russian advance remains about 18 miles from the city, a senior Defense Department official said Saturday. Russia has, however, sent reconnaissance forces into Kiev, the official said, declining to say how many of those troops have penetrated the city. About 50% of Russia's combat troops have entered Ukraine from up to 30% on Friday, the official said, characterizing the number in the tens of thousands of combat and logistics troops. Russian troops are advancing along the three major routes into Ukraine. If you've been paying attention to the news lately, you've seen these images. If you're on social media following Kristen or I, you've also seen these images and videos. And the only way I can describe them, Kristen, is shocking. Yeah, it's unfortunate that where we're at during this time frame, and this is what's happening in our world. Really is. If you've ever watched, you know, Band of Brothers or We Were Soldiers, even Saving Private Ryan. Those are things that you see in movies you would never imagine. I mean, we know that historically these things occurred, but to see them happening in real time, thanks to social media and the internet, people out there on the ground in the Ukraine are actually sending us real footage and not reenactments. And I think that's what's chilling. Yeah, I think that's one of the the benefits of social media now in that aspect is that we do see it in real time and it's not what the news wants us to be, to show us, you know, it's, it's real people that are there in person showing us the real raw stuff that's going on. And there's no editing that the media can like hide from us really. Right. And if you've noticed, I don't know um, on social media, if it's because of the heightened interest or because it's just an overwhelming amount of videos and photos coming through on Instagram and Facebook. But um, you know, but you and I have talked about this. My, traction on social media has slowed down. Um, conservative, most, a lot of conservative people, police people um, don't have the traction on social media that they used to do because they're censoring. You know, yeah. Another, another topic for another day. But um, my stuff that I've posted on the Ukraine has just been blowing up. And I think it's a combination of interest. And if you just Google, not Google, but uh, search the hashtag Ukraine, mm-hmm hundreds of thousands of images appear. I think the number is over millions. Um, It's just incredible. Excuse me. Can you hear that? No. Okay. There's a lot of noise coming from my house too, so it's okay. Um, But I I think like most Americans, you and I are not um, historical or wartime uh, geographical experts. So we rely- Not at all. Yeah. So we rely a lot on what we read on the news and what we see on the internet. And it's hard to decipher that, but I was able to look up um, why this all started. I mean, why did Russia just decide they were going to take over and invade the Ukraine? And I guess it stems down to, I mean, there's a lot of history there, but in recent times um, in 2014, it looked like Russia sent uh, its troops over, over to the Eastern part of Ukraine where Mm -hmm. there was two disputed territories. And Mm -hmm. they said, Hey, we're just going to take these disputed territories. There's a lot of pro-Russian people here. Um, so I I guess in the Ukraine, there's like 50%, um, ethnic Russians. 
mm-hmm. that have uh, gone to the Ukraine and have assimilated, you know, to become Russian Ukrainians. Yeah. And, um, but a lot of them have lived over on the east side and there was some political stuff going on over there and they decided they were just going to make this area um, in the peninsula and over in the east mm-hmm. kind of their own little area. And the Russians accused of all people, the U.S., of telling the Ukrainians to push this assimilation. No, you got to make those Russian Crimeans um, all, um, you know, assimilate to the Ukrainian culture. Mm-hmm. And um, Russian President Putin said, he actually wrote an essay <laughs> saying oh, funny. Um, that, you know, it's the, um, the this beginning of the assimil- push to assimilate Russians into Ukrainian is the beginning of genocide. And he was comparing the, the Ukrainians of being Nazi Germany mm-hmm. with the support of the United States. I mean, that's propaganda to the max, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's what we run on. Yeah. And, you know, I have some friends that are uh, ethnic Polish. They're, uh-huh. You know, they're Americans, but they're from Poland. And Poland is their neighbor. And they said that, you know, there's always kind of been um, uh, this unease, uneasiness with the border over there. Mm-hmm. Um, but it looks like in 2014, it kind of went over the top um, and it started pushing the Russia decided they were going to send some troops out to those areas. There were some stories that came out that said that Russian soldiers who took their insignias off uh, went over to the peninsula and started some conflict over there, mm-hmm. which caused um, uh, the Ukrainian uh, military to beef up its troops. And then Russia said, oh, well, the Ukraine's beefing up their troops and it's a threat to Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in 2020 or 2021, uh, President Zelensky, the president of uh, the Ukraine, mm-hmm. wanted to make a push to join NATO. Right. And, um, and if you're on the Eastern Bloc of Europe, you'd be a fool not to be a part of NATO, right? And your yeah. Military you're is, on the end. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you want military support. And, you know, everybody knows the United States is part of NATO. The, the world's superpowers are part of NATO. Yeah. And so you want that protection. Well, when... Zelensky started the plan to to get into NATO with a plan to be a part of NATO by 2021. Uh, President uh, Putin from Russia said it was a threat uh, to grow NATO even bigger and to have a nation so close to Russia is a threat to uh, the the sovereignty of Russia. Now, what do you think he would think having a world superpower that's there for peace is a threat to Russia? Huh? <laughs> Sorry, I was what, paying attention to something else. What happened? Why, why do you think uh, Putin thinks join, uh, joining um, NATO would be such a threat? I mean, well, because it's it, it's more people against him, I guess. And if he wants to, okay, correct me if I'm wrong, because again, I'm not a history buff, but he wants to restore part of the Soviet Union, right? And Ukraine was part of that, so he thinks that's within his right to own right. that country. Right. When, when the Soviets were in power, I mean, they were U- United States as rival I mean, and, you know, you and I grew up in the eighties. So we understood this. We saw it. Russia was the enemy. There was movies about Russia being the enemy. Right. Um, and um, we had a, an awesome president named Ronald Reagan that um, was instrumental in president, then Russian president Gorbachev um, dismantling the USSR and all these countries became sovereign and it just was Russia. But they still remained a military superpower. They still retained their nukes, which always made them kind of a threat. Mm-hmm. And then, then this guy comes along named Putin, who uh, is very charismatic to the Russian people. He rides horses in the snow, topless. Uh, he talks. <laughs> he does. There's a picture of him. Uh, and, and if okay. We're being, if we're being honest, he probably should have kept his shirt on. Um, <laughs> Oh my God. But this That's is the funny. kind of guy we're talking about. He's, a, he's one, I mean, I'm not saying he's a, um, the North Korean dude, Kim Jong-un. Yeah. Uh, cause that guy's completely nuts, but, um, you know, he's about 90% there. He yeah. puts off this image that he is a sophisticated modern president who, you know, we all know he met with, uh, president Trump mm-hmm. and everything was peaceful. Um, and then, mm-hmm. you know, and then there's stories that come out saying that he's got ties with the mafia, the the Chinese mafia, the Russian mob, the European mobs, and um, heavily involved in um, cyber crimes and hacking. And, you know, we all know about the election fiasco that they believe Russia was involved in. And yeah. um, I mean, all in all, 
everything that's pointing towards Putin is this guy's a bad dude. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. But so, I think that's why when you look at the public sentiment, people are supporting the Ukraine. I mean, they're the underdog anyway. Right. Um, and without knowing what's really going on between the Ukraine and Russia, people have automatically said, Hey, this is wrong. Anybody, yeah. everybody can see it. Isn't it kind of interesting that our, our in some way, shape or form, no matter what political group you're with or not with everybody kind of unifies to support Ukraine now. Yeah. A different country. Yeah. Which and I kind of find in, interesting because they think it's wrong that this this other party, this other group is coming in to like, you know, take over and, and kill all these innocent people. And it, you know, everybody's back in Ukraine, which I'm on board with. And then I don't know if you read either, but they're giving guns out to all of their, all of their citizens too, that want to stay and remain and fight. Yeah. And so you also see a lot of people here. I haven't seen any that speak down to that and say, why would you give them guns? Right. But yet we're against two a here, you know what yeah. I mean? It's so hypocritical. I think you it bring up a good point. It boggles my mind. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up because you're exactly right with what you said. Um, the 2A is okay overseas, but not here on our homeland yeah. where it's in the constitution. Yet we yeah. want to rewrite the constitution. Do you think after this is all said and done, um, they will have a 2A similar, something similar in their in the Ukrainian constitution? Probably now, I would yeah. think. I mean, they're... I mean, I don't know that much about Ukraine, but I mean, it pretty much seems like the president there would be on board with letting his citizens be armed after this. Because even if uh, they win this war, they're going to have to be on high alert, I would imagine, for quite some time after, at least right. on their borders. So I would think he'd be okay with it. Yeah, I think. Um... But I think he's a different leader, too. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's out. He, you see images of him on the front lines. Yeah, and it gave me chills to see that. And then also, I want to give credit to the mayor of Kiev. He's also out there. So these politicians that yeah. are, I mean, we're, we're used to seeing. I mean, I, I guess now we have um, military folks in um, in our Congress and Senate and stuff like that. And, um, but it's not likely that you'll see them on the front lines, right? I mean, they've oh, got people to protect them. I highly doubt that our president can even hold a rifle if he wanted right. to. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. but it's true. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't see that. I mean, you see, I don't know if it was the mayor or the president of Ukraine, but, um, or mayor of Kiev and the president, which one of them had the bulletproof vest on. And then I saw one of the headlines today that said that he turned down uh, getting out of the country by the U.S., all right. That he's going to stay there with his people. You know, uh, we talk about them, the two way in Ukraine. Um, and it, it does. I mean, if you arm your people, it sends a message that what kind of nation you are, that you're ready to fight. And you see hundreds of stories coming out. Uh, I saw an image this morning of a, a lady who looked like she was in her 70s mm -hmm. uh, with a soldier teaching her how to aim and fire. Yeah. Uh, you see young men kissing their wives and kids goodbye mm -hmm. on trains. Um, so they can volunteer and fight. It's the result. And a lot of that reminds me of kind of uh, the American resolve, uh, which also reminds me of back in World War II when um, the Japanese invaded Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, the, there was an admiral, uh, a Japanese admiral that said, you can't attack inland. Um, the quote was, you cannot invade mainland United States. There would be a rifle behind each blade of grass. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I mean, we made a joke yesterday. You, you and Danny and uh, Liz and I went out um, to celebrate Danny's birthday yesterday. And during our conversation, we talked about the fact that um, if they invaded the United States, they would come to the West Coast first. Mm -hmm. But we jokingly said, good luck. I mean, you might get Malibu, you might get Huntington Beach, Newport Beach. But once you're going a little inland to Inglewood, Long Beach, <laughs> you're going to start running into Crips and Bloods, Serenios. MS-13, and every single one of those guys will gangster yeah. with their guns. And All bets will be <laughs> off. They protect yeah. their hoods. <laughs> right. Um, you know, so the, the American resolve, uh, we, we recognize it, but I definitely see it in the Ukrainians. Obviously, this Ukrainian yeah. resolve and kudos to those people. Um, yeah, they're not yeah. giving up without a fight. And that's, that's awesome. I saw um, a couple of different quotes. Uh, one that stuck out to me was, I guess they were hiding in like a subway. And so they were asking if this one female was going to leave or not. And she's like, no, I'm going to start making a Molotov cocktails. Wow. 
Yeah. You got to do what you can. I mean, if you're not going to leave with, you know, the other women and children and maybe elderly, but other than that, I think they, they said, I forgot what the age group, but it was young, young boys all the way up to, I think their sixties or something. were not allowed to leave. They had to stay to fight with their country. Yeah. Hey, so we, we, we have the civil service. Um, that's, is it called the civil service? I forget all boys. Um, before you turned 18, I remember having to do this uh, when I got my driver's license. You had to sign up for the civil service record or something like that. I forget what it's called. 